Bloomberg. Received her neuroscience degree, PhD, from Boston University. Currently lives in Washington, D.C. She's um, a native of Rochester, so all that these things. So, um, works right currently also as an adjunct professor at Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia, and as an associate scholar with the Charlotte Mosier Institute. And if you're not familiar with them, I highly encourage you as a pro-life person to get to know the Charlotte Mosier Institute. The statistics and the information and the things they do there is outstanding. They're kind of the counterpart to the Guttmacher Institute, um, which Nick mentioned earlier, um, established by Guttmacher, which is kind of pro-abortion type thing. So please familiarize yourself with the Charlotte Mosier Institute if you haven't. Um, she enjoys, um, as you can read in her bio, but I wanted to share this. She likes enjoying uh, or enjoys educating science and non-scientists on embryonic and fetal development because you're more likely to support life-affirming policies. And that's a great, an, another way that we can attack this issue is the more important we can be. So um, with that, thank you very much for being here today, and we look forward to hearing about the brain of the unborn. Is that? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, if you guys um, see this little screen behind you, um, I have a really fun part of the talk where I actually get you guys to participate. Um, you guys are small enough we could have done this by hand, but um, it's fun to watch this in real time. So if you can text uh, Katrina for 260 to this number, 22333, and then when you do so, just put your cell phone like smack down, upside down, like on the table so I see that you're ready to go. Um, Obviously, if you have to pay for texting or something, don't feel obliged to participate. Um, but I'm going to give you just a minute to get your cell phones ready. As Nick said, I'm, I'm putting the T yeah, on the link. It's um, not case sensitive. And if I had known they were going to use my first and last name, I would have signed up to something cool like prenatal neuroscience. <laughs> um, but. That's the code they gave me, so. Yep, so text 222333, that's the number you're texting to, and then text my name with that 260. Yeah. after your name on Two, six, oh. Two, six, zero. Okay. So today we won't go into a ton of depth about when does life begin because that's what our keynote speaker will be talking about. We will touch on it briefly. Uh, we'll go through the major milestones of brain development. We'll answer some important technical questions about how the brain develops and um, also get into some topics that are hot button issues like when can the fetus feel um, does childbirth make any difference? Um, and what do we know now that we didn't know in 1972 when Roe vs. Wade was passed? We'll finish with five to ten minutes of Q&A. So the key question in my mind is, is the unborn a member of the human family? And if so, then killing the unborn is a serious moral offense. And I'm going to argue today that the only time that we can really uh, pinpoint that won't rely on an emotional argument is that after conception we have a unique human individual with a unique set of 46 chromosomes. We're 
never going to get another human individual with that same genetic material, with that same rolling of the dice. Um, and so that is why we need to protect them. Um, uh, all right. So let me slide into this real quick. And basically, start thinking when is the first neural tissue born? Okay, you guys are on the right track for sure. It's actually, it's 15 days after conception. Um, so at about nine days after conception, we still have mostly um, a mass of cells that's implanting into the um, uterine wall. Um, but by 15 days after conception, um, we're going to have an embryo that has sides and that has neural tissue. So let's get into that in more depth. Um, so uh, most of you guys, um, have heard that there's 40 weeks in gestation, um, and that is correct. Um, it's dated two different ways. Um, basically, the dating um, in the olden times was from the woman's last menstrual period. So those first two weeks are while her egg is developing. So conception basically happens at two weeks gestation um, or, zero, or day zero. Um, post conception. So there's going to be two ways of dating. I'm going to use the dating after conception throughout my talk. Um, but if you ever hear like some people arguing about numbers, you know that's why. It's because there's actually two ways to date um, how far along a woman is. So we're going to talk about conception. Um, so at day zero, there's an egg in her fallopian tube, and sperm reaches the egg. Um, neither the sperm nor the egg dies, per se. Um, the sperm enters the egg, it, um, its genetic tissue comes out into the egg, forms a new nucleus, and they start dividing. And those first cell divisions actually take a long time. It's important to get those correct. Um, so actually, in day one, you get just a single, you basically get this fertilization act, and then you get the first cell division. And in day two, you actually get the next cell division. And this starts very slow, um, because if something goes wrong, um, you end up with a uh, pregnancy that's not going to work. Um, and then, basically, this is also where identical twins come from. They happen basically in this uh, time frame between day two and day three. If those cells break off, um, they're actually, they're still pluripotent, they're ready to become anything, and if they no longer are in contact with each other, they'll start forming two separate entities. Um, so you get a lot of these cell divisions, and about one week later, what you've got is a hollow ball of cells. And this hollow ball of cells is called a plasticist, and it's going to implant into the uterine wall. And how it implants is going to determine what part, which of those cells are going to become part of the embryo or part of the placenta. Um, now, because we were, were dating from conception, she's going to expect her period about four weeks from her last period, uh, so around day 15. And at day 15, a lot of things have already happened. We've got sides established. So this embryo has a left side, a right side, a top side, and a bottom side. And um, there's a single cord of material called the notochord, and that is going to turn a whole bunch of cells around it into neural tissue. And this is why at day 15, this is our first neural tissue, rather than just part of um, the uh, generic embryo. And then most women um, are not as regular as this. Um, and a lot of people wait um, to take a pregnancy test. So they often don't know they're pregnant until they're about one week after this. Um, and one week after the neural tissue um, 
has started to be established, it's actually closing and forming a um, forming the spinal cord and the brain. So an interesting side point here: um, our red contains folic acid. Um, probably if we go for lunch and you grab some red, then you're going to get some folic acid in it um, because. 22 days after conception, half the women in the world don't even know they're pregnant. They have, they're like, okay, I'm a little late, maybe I'm stressed. Um, and this is a critical time in fetal development because if your neural tube doesn't close, you're gonna end up either with spina bifida, if it doesn't close at the bottom, or anencephaly, if it doesn't close at the top. And that, can be, that is equal. Um, and so, folic acid is something that you need for healthy cell division. Um, and some people are lacking. So in 1998, um, this was actually a really good government regulation, they um, said all enriched bread should contain folic acid, and since they did that, there's about 1,300 less babies born with defects every year. Um, so it's a very dramatic cutoff. Um, so again, uh, we have that notochord that makes this neural tube um, from the outer layer of tissue in the cell, or in the embryo, and you actually get a zipping up and down. So you start sort of in the middle of your neck, and you close in both directions, down towards the bottom and up towards the top. Oops. And then that neural tube, which if you guys see, is actually this part right here, is going to also be sending chemical messengers to the cells around it, and telling those cells you need to become peripheral neurons for me. You're going to become touch receptors and neurons that are gonna to wire to muscles so that I can move and feel. And short, very shortly after this, we actually get the fetal heartbeat starting. Um, so three weeks and one day post-conception, the fetal heart starts beating. And by the fourth week, we have a structure that we would call the brain. So we have the brain in three sections. We have the forebrain, which is going to end up to being our cortex and all of our like reasoning and sensory processing. We've got the midbrain, which is going to do a lot of things like balance and sound localization for us, and that hindbrain, which is going to be regulating all of our life-sustaining activities. Um, we also know in the fourth week the eyes and ears start to form. And then by the fifth week, we actually get the earliest fetal movements detected in ultrasounds. Uh, then one week later, uh, the forebrain actually doubles in size over approximately three days. And this is when um, we actually know there is a fetal EEG that can be detected. Um, when I first saw this data, I was actually extremely skeptical. I was like, how can a baby the size of the grape um, be producing an EEG? Can actually uh, measure. Um, but the truth is, this was actually taken from an ectopic pregnancy. Um, so they had to remove um, the fetus to protect the mom. Uh, they actually preserved the fetus outside the womb and put electrodes in to measure what kind of neural activity is going on. Um, I put brain death at the top to give you a reference. If there was nothing going on, that's what we'd expect. And actually, 90 minutes into the recording, that's what they get. The, the fetus is dead. Um, but at the beginning, they actually saw normal rhythms, which are not, not so far different from what we see even in adults. And even things that we see in adults, such as sleep spindles, which help, in, um, help adults form long-term memories. Um, we also know that in this time frame, the neurons are not just existing, they start communicating and working. Um, and they connect to each other via synapses. So one sends a chemical message to the other, and the other one will respond. And what's crazy to me is that between seven weeks and 28 weeks, these fetuses are creating 250,000 neurons a minute in order to grow their brain. Um, so it's really, really explosive growth. Um, we also see in this time frame um, lots of spontaneous movements and ultrasounds. Um, and what's important to know is that this means there are neurons that are working um, to make these movements. You need at least one neuron connected to the neuromuscular junction to make, um, to make a, a twitch.
which are some sort of movement. And at the end of seven weeks, we see the first, um, the first reflexes, such as moving away from a touch. Um, if you also spend enough time observing these ultrasounds, you'll see that the fetus is already showing a preference for either right or left-handedness, um, which is pretty great. The brain is one of the most important things um, to grow and get right. And so at eight weeks in utero, the brain is actually almost 50% of the body weight. It's 43%, whereas your brain is only 82% of your body weight. So. All right, and then um, in the next couple of weeks, we get just much more uh, complex systems. So fetuses will be hiccuping, they'll be reaching for objects, swallowing amniotic fluid. Um, and we know at this point, too, that there are touch and pain receptors covering their skin, um, especially in their face and hands. Um, the truth is, there might actually be pain receptors even earlier than this, but this is like a scientific scavenger hunt. So all of these milestones that I've put forth are, um, are things that we know um, mostly through, um, through unfortunate uh, tragedies basically, like ectopic pregnancies, where we remove a fetus and get to learn about how developed it is at that particular point in time. Um, the only things that are really safe to observe outside the womb are fetal heart rate, fetal movement. Um, we just don't have technology that allows us to see brain development at a fine scale, um, basically under 26 weeks. So at a point when the baby could already be delivered and outside the womb, that's when we can start studying what's going on um, in terms of functional con connections in the womb. So another quick point I want to make is that um, the earliest um, age of viability that I have read about um, is a boy named Dakota Harris. He was born at 19 weeks post-conception. And he weighed about one pound. Um, to give you a frame of reference for that, the earliest state abortion restriction is in Mississippi, and that's at 20 weeks. So Dakota Harris could be legally aborted in all 50 states at 19 weeks. Um, but with proper uh, postnatal care, um, he left the hospital five months later, um, weighing seven pounds, five ounces. Um, and his brain was approximately at this five month stage. So he had gone from these smaller stages where the brain is sort of bent forward and he found his brain in the correct, um, in the correct spot, essentially. All the systems were there. They just needed to do a lot more developing um, in, order to, um, in order to continue growing. Now, um, I got some interesting questions the last time I gave this talk about what exactly happens when you're born too young. Um, do you get permanent brain damage? And the answer is, um, it depends a lot on, um, on how you're born, how much oxygen you get. What usually happens is you get a sort of insult, so you don't, you have like a period of stunted growth while your body is focused on surviving. But then you continue to grow. So like if you come up, you know, two or three or four months premature, you do have this small, like, it's almost like a hiccup in your growth, but then you do catch up again someday. Um, you're just doing all of your growing outside the womb, which is a little harder to do. Um, so between seven and nine months, this is where you get most of your preemies. Um, you basically go from having a pretty smooth brain um, to a pretty bumpy brain. Um, and this is a good thing for you. The more bumps you have in the brain, the more neurons you can able to um, so this is what we're, this is the end goal, you know, the baby spring, we want it to look like that. Uh, so how do some cells become neurons, and how do they get where they need to go? If you're a cell that's born, why don't you just become a toenail? So let's figure that out. Um, so the, the brain is grown from the inside out, and I mean that in two different ways. Um, the first parts of your brain to fully develop are those uh, farthest uh, interior parts. So that hind brain that's going to sustain life is the first part that really gets
is locked in place. Um, and then later, your cortex is sort of that final uh, frontier. And you can see that that was where a lot of the growth was happening um, after um, five months. And then your cortex also grows from the inside out. So the cortex, the interior part, is sort of that interior, that neural tube that we talked about earlier. Um, and it stays like that. And all of the cell division happens on this very like inside area. And then what's really cool, if you see these red cells here, these are called uh, radial glia. So a neuron says, okay, I'm born at month four, and that means I'm going to become a subplate neuron. And so even though it's born at the very bottom of this slide, the neurons climb up the radial glia to the correct spot where they're supposed to end up. And this is what it actually looks like in an electron microscope. And so those radial glia continue to grow outward, and the new neurons continue to get locations where they jump off and stay that are sort of farther and farther out as um, development progresses. We also get these important neurons called interneurons, and these guys are great. If you did not have interneurons, and right now we, we would all be seizing on the floor. Like our brains would just be way too active. Um, and these guys are there to hold activity back. Um, what's super cool about brain development with interneurons is that neurons need to fire together to wire together. And so most of the time, a neuron wouldn't want to make a connection with an interneuron because it's going to stop it from firing. So basically, these baby interneurons actually act as excitatory neurons. And then around the age of two, they switch and say, instead of exciting you, I'm going to hold you back. And I'm not going to let you fire as much as you have been. Um, these guys are cool. They keep growing after birth. Uh, in fact, they keep going to where they're going until about two years old. And then they make this switch. Um, OK. And who wants to be brave and tell me which of these images looks like it has the most neurons in it. What do you think, Steve? Two years. Two years. Great. And two years is a really good guess. It's actually there are less neurons in this one than there are in the one month one. The one month ones are really, really small. At two years, they are the most connected that they will ever be. So it is sort of a trick question. Um, but newborns have about 100 billion neurons at birth. Um, and then by the time you're an adult, you actually, you guys probably have closer to 60 billion neurons. Um, so it's not the worst thing in the world. It's actually OK. Um, this is sort of how God designed it to work, that we would be able to really connect all over the place. And then we would be able to um, sort of prove and pick the correct and also, you can see that at one month, these neurons are barely connected to each other. But then at nine months, they're making a lot of connections. And at two years, they are super well connected. And a two-year-old actually has at least two times more um, synaptic connections than they're going to need. And what's sort of cool about this is that each of those synaptic connections um, needs to get refined. So if you've ever watched a two-year-old try and cut with scissors, um, you'll notice that they're really not very good at it. And a big reason for this is they've actually got two or three or four neurons connected to each of their muscles. And you and I um, most likely only have one neuron innervating each muscle so that we have just one signal that says, okay, contract and cut with your scissors. Um, and so that is a big reason why they have much worse um, gross motor skills and fine motor skills than we do. Um, this also is a reason why they can smell a lot better than we can. Um, because each smell requires a single neuron to process. And we basically, um, through our experience, decide, I want to keep the chocolate neuron, but I don't want to keep this like peanut butter fudge neuron. Um, 
And so if you've never been exposed to peanut butter fudge, you might smell that peanut butter fudge and be like, is that chocolate? Or I don't have a category for this. And that's because your brain is trying to be efficient. It's trying to keep the neurons that you need, but not the ones you don't need. All right, and why do some cells become neurons anyway? Um, so you guys remember that note accord from day 15? It was emitting a chemical signal called sonic hedgehog. And the sonic hedgehog was named after, uh, there was a postdoc who came home from work one day. He said, I think I've identified a unique chemical and he asked his daughter, what should I call it? And she said, sonic hedgehog. And uh, he didn't think it was going to be a, a extremely important chemical, uh, but it is one of the most important chemicals in neuroscience. Um, and so sonic hedgehog actually interacts with DNA in order to turn a cell into neural tissue. So if you take um, from a chicken cell that's growing and you take um, some, neuron, some cells out from what would become the neural tissue, but before it's touched the sonic hedgehog, when you separate that out, it just becomes skin. But if it's touched the sonic hedgehog, even at all, if you take those cells and you separate them out on a plate, it will become neurons. We also know um, that chemical messengers are just really important um, for getting cells to connect to each other. So here's another um, chemical messenger. These are cells code, these neurons, connect <coughs> via axons hitting dendrites. The axons are trying to find the right uh, receiving neurons, and they do so by following these paths. And here is a case where uh, sem the semaphorin is not one of the growth bones lengths. They avoid semaphorin 3A. Um, and what's also cool about growth, growth cones is that they are going to get to where they need to go. So actually, some scientists took some axons that were migrating to where they needed to go. They actually cut them off from the cell, and the axon still finished making it to its destination um, before it, it didn't obviously survive. But neurons, or these axons, have a destination based on when they were born and what chemical messengers are in the area. And finally, if anyone ever tries to make a, um, a argument to you that um, fetuses are completely underdeveloped and we should wait till um, development is completely complete um, to protect an individual. Um, this is a really good study for you. So myelination is the last step that happens in the brain. And basically this is where a whole bunch of fats sort of come and surround the axons and they let the, ax the neurons communicate a lot more quickly. Um, so in this pretty picture, um, basically blues and grays means that there's not a lot of myelin, and reds and orange means there are. So you can see that these first four years of life, there's a lot more red in a five and a half year old, meaning a lot more myelin, than there was in a one and a half year old. So myelination um, typically happens as a pathway gets fully functional. So your breathing pathways get myelinated first. Um, starts around four months post-conception. And does anyone want to take a guess about when it ends? If you've heard this before. What do you think? From your, it looks like seven to eight on your chart there. Seven to eight is a good guess looking at the chart. At the bottom is actually how much, what percentage of myelin there is, and it ends at five and a half years is the top. So it's really good looking at the chart. And you had a guess? Early 20s. Early 20s. Yes, that is right. It ends around age 25. So probably the majority of the students in this room, um, your brain is still in progress, which is good news. Um, it starts at four months, yeah, post-conception. All right. I sort of like. Uh, breaking for questions in the middle, especially after this dense part. Does anyone have a question before we move on? Because um, this was like all of the science, and then we're going to get into the topics. Yeah? Do you have a course? Is there a course uh, that's taught online that you... That would be fun. Like this? So far, this is, this is all I have. Okay, now do you yeah. know of another course uh, 
It's kind of a comprehensive course for field development. Yeah, you know, I've been wanting to take like an embryology, like a graduate embryology course, because I think it would be really fun. Um, I don't, I have some good resources at the end where you can, um, like there's a early human development website, goes through all the milestones and like some scientific evidence from each one. So that would be my recommendation. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would be, I would be, I would love to do a neurodevelopment course at some point. So. Mm -hmm. I, I'm actually planning on making one this summer at the university that uh, I'm at. I, I teach uh, human embryology, so uh, oh, cool. I, I may have one. All right, cool. So what, we can wait until the summer. What's your name? Uh, Derek Dorosky. Oh. oh. Our keynote okay. speaker. Excellent. Yep. Oh, I'm very much struck by the fact that you said the ectopic pregnancy is removed, and um, it sounds like intact, in order to then, and you're able to measure brain waves from the um, from the child. Is that child then considered born at that point, given a birth certificate? Um, what what is I mean, yes, what is its legal status? Yes. Um, what is the status of that embryo that has been removed from, from the mother? Not her womb, yeah. obviously, right. with that topic. Right. That is a great question. Um, so these studies were performed between 1955 and 1961. Um, both, the, both the doctors who did it are currently deceased. Um, but I talked to their son, who's also a pediatric neurologist. Um, and I don't think they were issued any sort of birth certificate. Um, I think there's like seven or eight of them total, not all of us young. Um, but they were actually, they were pro-life scientists, um, OBs, and because, um, because being removed at six or seven weeks is essentially lethal um, to the fetus, um, that's why I'm pretty sure they, they didn't get a birth certificate. They didn't get the same rights. I mean, you wouldn't do a depth electrode recording in a human you would expect it to live um, because the electrode penetrates into the brain. Um, but it was considered ethical at the time because there was no chance for, for someone that young to survive. Yeah. Okay, yes, and we're just tapping her watch at me. So let's keep going. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about childbirth. Um, so a lot of people say, oh, I don't care until the child's born. I would say your environment has very little to do with um, your moral status. Um, but there are some fascinating things that happen in childbirth. Usually you have, um, you have like a car accident, for instance. You have about 10 to 20 times your normal fight or flight hormone responses and neurotransmitter responses. But childbirth is the single most traumatic thing that has ever happened to you. And I can guarantee it because your fight or flight uh, responses went up almost to 100 times um, the normal amount that you had. This would be enough to cause any of us adults to have a stroke. Um, so it was very traumatic for you. Um, but it's important for, that, um, for the processes to work because if you don't take that first breath, that's really bad. Um, in also, in, during birth, um, there's a lot of chance for oxygen deprivation as the umbilical cord is squeezed, as the baby is squeezed. All right, so here's a little bit more of the interactive stuff. Um, so this is to highlight the fact that your experience in the womb sort of shapes what you can do. So you can't see in the womb, and therefore, four-day-old infants have some trouble distinguishing colors. Ordeal infants can distinguish white from which of the following colors? Go ahead and text your guess. Blue is A, yellow is B, orange is C, green is D. Okay. I think a couple of you guys have been at my talk before. Um, and it's actually, it's not blue, it's orange. Orange is the color that um, babies have the hardest time distinguishing from white. Um, here's another one. A normal adult has 20-20 vision. 
Um, and an adult is legally blind if their better eye can only see 2200 or less. So what's the visual acuity of an average newborn? Is it 2060? That's A. 2100 is B. 2240 is C. Or 2640? You guys are definitely on the right track again. Um, newborns are definitely visually, um, are legally blind. They are not just at 2240 though, they are at 2640, which means that what we could see at 640 feet away, you need to bring to 20 feet in front of an infant for it to see. Okay, 12 to 36 hours after birth, in what ways can a baby recognize its mother? Can he do it, A, by smelling her milk without her around, B, by sight in the absence of sound or smell, C, by hearing her, but without being able to smell or see her or all of the above? All right, very fun, yes. It is actually all of the above. Um, the baby has been smelling the mother's amniotic fluid and drinking the mother's amniotic fluid, so it will immediately be able to recognize both her and her milk um, from the smells of any of, usually they give the baby like three samples of smells, the mom and two other women of the same race, usually two. Um, and so they can do that with their milk. Um, even though babies are really bad at seeing, uh, they can they can do face shape in order to figure out um, the mother by sight and by hearing, because they've been hearing the mom and her language. And, and finally, which of the following flavors can a newborn not taste until about four months old? Uh, salt is A, sugar is B, sour is C, bitter is D, and that savory, meaty flavor, umami, is E. on this one is surprisingly the answer is salt. Um, babies don't actually have the taste receptors for salt until uh, about four months old. Um, and finally, uh, at birth the newborn will be able to distinguish mom's voice from strangers as well as her language and her smell. We just talked about that. Also an interesting study, um, at six months after birth, the baby will for oats with carrot juice if the mom was assigned to drink carrot juice once a day for a month while she was pregnant. So you can influence um, what your children will like in the future by eating the right things while you're pregnant. Um, the next point I want to make is that experience is really required for neural circuitry to form correctly. So a child raised in the absence of language by the age seven will actually have a lot of trouble learning a language at that point. Same with vision. If you form cross-eyed, you really need to get that surgically corrected so that deaf perception um, develops correctly. And then there's some new theories that basically say one of the reasons that we can't remember our life before age four was that we just didn't have enough experience with who, what, where, and when, and how memory. Uh, so we're not sure how much of our fetal experience modulates these later critical periods, or is itself a critical period, but this is a fun place where people um, make guesses. And now I want to go through um, an important argument. Um, a lot of people want to say, okay, I want to protect the baby once the baby can feel pain. But whether or not a human can feel pain doesn't actually influence their moral worth. I just want to say that before I begin. But here are the key points you want to remember. The fetus is, move, is moving reflexively away from painful stimuli consistently by seven and a half weeks post-perception. So a prod into the um, 
into the amniotic sac to pull stuff to make them move away. And this pain reflex arc is actually the first neural circuit to form and also the last to die upon brain death. Um, so you can get these retraction movements. Um, they're some of the very first things to form. Now pro-life, or pro-choice doctors and lawyers have argued that this movement away is not enough. That pain has an emotional component. And they want to say that as long as there's not this emotional or cognitive processing that says, I'm in pain, then it's not really pain. Um, I think that's sort of bogus, um, personally, because if you're getting a, a movement away from pain, that seems to be enough. Um, but if they, if they're insistent, um, then what you need is a connection into a structure called the thalamus. Um, and when you go up to the thalamus, then you're going to move on to the outer um, reasoning and processing structures of the cortex. And scientists can consistently find these, um, these connections outside the womb at 21 weeks post-conception. However, um, if you look at aborted fetal tissue, um, we know those connections are likely in place somewhere between 16 and 20 weeks. Um, again, this is sort of a place where conflict of interest arises. Um, people who want to search for it earlier also don't want to be working with aborted fetal tissue from 14 week old fetuses. Um, and so the 16 to 20 weeks, we know it's there, um, but we don't know if it's there even earlier than that. Um, and another thing that we can um, stake our hats on is that as early as 18 weeks, if you cause the fetus pain, for instance during a fetal surgery, um, we know that there's huge stress responses to the pain. That would be very indicative of this emotional or higher order processing of pain. It's not just pain, but it's also stress caused by pain. Um, then you'll also hear some crazy arguments that the fetus is just asleep the whole time. Um, that's not completely true. They do sleep a lot, 90 to 95% of the day. Um, and they actually sleep in cycles about half as long as we do. Um, and they get both kinds of sleep that we do too, both the deep sleep and the dreaming sleep. Um, what's cool is we know that even at 29 and 30 weeks, the baby can learn musical patterns and stories that it will recognize 10 or 12 weeks later when it comes out. It will prefer the stories that it's heard already or the sounds that it's already learned to ones that are new. Um, we also have some new technology um, assisting us in knowing what's going on. Um, so there's two major types of surgeries that will happen in utero. One is an open heart surgery to fix um, heart defects, and the other one is spina bifida closure. And Usually, in terms of development, it's easy. It's best to do this really early. But their timing now is around 23 to 26 weeks post-conception. And that's because if they have to deliver the baby, if something goes wrong in the surgery, they want to give the baby the best chance of survival outside the womb. Um, also importantly, they do fetal anesthesia separately from maternal anesthesia. So everyone who wants to say, like, oh, pain is not a big deal, um, each, both the baby and the mother, get separate anesthesiologists during these surgeries. Um, also cool, we can actually see inside the fetal brain uh, using fetal MRI. Basically, the mom puts her belly into one of these machines, and they can scan the brain and also see what parts of the fetal brain are active. So that starts around 26 weeks where we can consistently see what the baby is doing. So I just want to end with my thesis here. The scientific way to define unique human individuals is really conception. Um, any other argument is going to rely on emotional appeals. So if they say, oh, the baby's underdeveloped, consider newborns. Newborns are a lot less developed than we are. If they say it's environment, consider Dakota Harrison, who, again, could have been legally aborted in every state of the union. Uh, if they say, oh, the baby's too dependent, um, consider transplant patients who need their transplant medication to survive. Um, and to the argument that, well, fetuses are sent straight to heaven anyway, um, consider God's justice in the world, and has he ever let us be the ones to say, oh, it's time for you to die.
Um, and also remember the highest goal of pro life advocate is not in winning debates, but it's loving women, listening well, and being available if a friend ever finds herself in an unplanned pregnancy. Um, we want to be pro life and not just pro birth. So if you can, find ways to volunteer at your local pregnancy resource center and really be there um, for moms who are facing really hard decisions. Cool. And this is just some places you can go if you want to learn some more um, about fetal pain or um, human development. These are some of my major sources. Cool. Do you guys have any questions? I'm sorry, I have another one. Yeah. Kind of a monopoly, but uh, can, can a child remember specific things from uh, just the two months after birth? I mean, if they if it didn't, could be triggered. Uh, if you heard a thing, I heard something when I was two months old, mm -hmm. and then I heard it when I was 50, could I, would it trigger? Um, that's a great question. Uh, for the most part, we think no. The earliest would probably be around three and a half, um, and usually Plus? it's, uh, no, three and a half years. Okay. And usually it's something traumatic. It's actually the easiest way to inform a long-term memory. What's interesting about this is that like, for instance, a two and a half year old will remember what they did at age two. Like, they'll still have memory that lasts, you know, a couple of months or even a year. Um, but that, that slowly diminishes. Like, as they get older, they stop being able to remember it too. Yeah. Yeah? You mentioned in your talk that uh, uh, preborn uh, children can recognize, hear uh, music and hear stories, and they'll actually could more prefer those uh, types of the type of music and the type of stories they hear. Mm -hmm. Is that um, then also an argument for how we form one's basis in which we form uh, culture then and the culture is passed on from mother to child and is they hear it in the, 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 the tones and tonal structures and the and the legends and such that the most commonly told by a culture? Yes, I would say it definitely starts in the womb. We know flavor, for instance, is one of the big ones. This is why, um, you know, like children in India, they tolerate spicy breast milk, basically, because they've had spicy amniotic fluid, and then they eat spicy rice, and they're a lot better at tolerating that than people who aren't eating spicy cuisines. So if you want your child to be able to eat the, his, 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 his or her carrots, or his or her celery, once um, online class that said that um, the sweet things that a mother does for her child, the healthy things, sights, sounds, touch, um, that I guess a healthy mother would be programmed to do with her child or actually wiring the brain in an appropriate manner. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so back at that slide where we were talking about how neurons were growing and then how they were wiring like crazy those first two years. Um, someone re recently asked me, like, so are those first two years the most pivotal? And I would say yes, they, they absolutely are from the neuroscience perspective. Um, those neurons that are getting activated by these positive interactions are going to be the neural circuits that get maintained and survive and that are going to be shaping sort of the individual um, long term. So I guess my next question with that is, is that if you have a parent who is parenting who has maybe a mental illness or some behaviors that wouldn't allow consistent parenting in a healthy manner, and then you have a parent who is um, parenting an adoptive parent or a grandmother, someone who is parenting in a healthy manner, not biologically connected, but doing the healthy things, would you say that the chances of mental health issues are lessened because their brain has been wired in an appropriate manner as much as possible, you know. Yes, yeah, I would definitely say so, that those those first two or three years are very critical, and okay. consistency is going to really help with getting those healthy circuits. Okay. Yeah. Well, any more questions? 